Good morning, guys. Hey, today, oh, I don't know if I can get through this. Today, I'm here to testify to the goodness of God. Amen? Amen. Uh, Tova and I were on our way home uh, a couple weeks ago from a dog show. Took my dog, Baby, and Tova's dog, Runa. Baby is kind of a stress mess in the car. Uh, she's out of her mind in the car. <laughs> so coming back, we were, it's about an eight-hour trip to Boise. Coming back, we were about three hours in. We'd already stopped three times. We stopped, pulled over on the side of the freeway, or an exit, gave her water, checked her. She's fine. And so we get back on the, in the car, set the GPS, and we're driving about 10 minutes until it's like, where are we? And we're driving through the middle of wheat fields. Like, ah, what happened? The GPS popped us off. And we're driving, and Tova goes, oh, great, I'm almost out of gas. I got 40 miles. And it's 30 miles to a little town called Prosser. So roughly about a half hour later, we stop in Prosser, we get gas, and I say, I'm going to check on the dogs. I open the hatch, and babies collapsed in the back of the car. When we had stopped previously, she was such a stress mess, I gave her Benadryl, because I gave her four Benadryl, because she was just like, and she's collapsed in the car, and I was like, did the Benadryl knock her out? No, she is non-responsive. Her tongue's hanging out. She's barely breathing. I'm in a complete panic. Toba finds a little vet in Prosser. They have no doctor on call, and they give us a card. The little gal goes, you need to go here, and it's a card to an emergency vet 30 miles away the opposite direction. Tova's going, I don't want to know how fast you are going, Tova, down the freeway. I'm in the back, calling out to God, trying to revive this dog. She is non-responsive. Pull into the emergency. There's no other people being seen at that very moment. They take her in. I wait for two hours in this room. Tova's outside with her dog. The vet comes in. And she goes, I'm not going to sugarcoat. Situation is grave. She's blind. She's non-responsive. Her blood pressure's in the tank. We think she's got internal bleeding. She's bleeding out her nose and her heart. We've given her epinephrine and her heart is rate has gone to down. And I go, well, it's not my first rodeo. Tell me what you think. And she goes, well, I think euthanasia is not a, a bad option. And we're just like, what the heck happened to her? I thought heat exhaustion. She goes, no, she's having an anaphylactic shock of some sort. So call Tova in, call my co-breeder who co-owns the dog with me. We make the decision. The tech comes in. I pick out the urn for the dog where the ashes get shipped. I pay for all that. We're just sitting there like, what in the world has happened? They call us. They say, do you want a special room or in the back room? We go into the back room. She's on a gurney. They have the syringes laying there on the table. Tova's bawling. I'm, tr I'm in task mode. Let's get her done. I you know. And I, then I put my arms around her and I whisper, baby, I'm here. She picks her head up and she looks and she, the vet had come over and the vet looks at her and she goes, oh my word. She looks at Tova and Tova's like, we can't. And the vet calls the other consulting vet in and they look at her and she's starting to be responsive and she can see. Okay. <laughs> so... Then they discuss that they think they should give her plasma overnight because they think they should give her a chance. Well, it's super expensive. Call my co-breeder. Her ex is willing to foot the bill. What? Okay. So we wait overnight, get the call in the morning. She didn't respond the way they thought. We really do need to euthanize. Tova and I had gotten a hotel room. We went in. Long story short, we got there, and the new vet goes, she's up and running around. What? <laughs> They just couldn't believe it. Long story short, this dog pulled through. I had people in the dog community that came around. They supported. They called. They sent messages. Some of y'all were praying. I just got to thinking about this. Had we not taken that wrong turn somehow, we wouldn't have got to the little vet. We wouldn't have gotten. Had I not given her the Benadryl, the vet said it probably saved her life. They think she got stung by something when we stopped. The thing is that that community of dog people surrounded me and Tova and my dog, and they, they, one lady we sold a puppy to paid for a night's boarding for my dog. She ended up staying there for th three nights, I think. People just surrounded us with love, prayer, and support. Got to thinking, that's what we do as a church, right? We have this community when something happens. We, we surround each other. We, we're there for each other. And when we give... We're expressing God's love to other people. I felt so loved and supported by people who, people
people I didn't even know, the whole vet staff reduced their vets, the fee at the office for us because they cared so much. They treated me like family, and we're family, right? So when things happen, when we don't have this community of support here in our church, you're a lone ranger dangling out there. And when we give, we're expressing God's love through that giving to other people. We're expressing encouragement to Pastor James that we're building this church. We're creating a church later on. People don't even know we're coming, but we're here, right? So I would encourage you when you think about giving, it's not just your duty to put that money in. You can put money in the box. You can give online. But it's to build that community and to express God's love through that giving. Let me pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the miracles you you do for us that we just, we're blown away by your goodness and the love you express uniquely, individually to each one of us. Go ahead of these gifts, Lord, of our tithes. We pray that you would use them to build your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. What's up, guys? We are in our current series, Stuff I Can't Ask in Church. So we've got some questions we can't ask in church. So we left the church. Excuse me, sir. Can we, can we ask you some questions? Has hypocrisy kept you away from the church? No. No. Can I ask what has? Uh, peer pressure has kept me away from the church. Mm. What part about forgiveness is hard? The last, the few morals I have left. If they mean it, though, it's easier, not easy. What part about forgiveness might be hard? Forgetting. Forgetting? If you're going to forgive, you truly have to forget. You can't, yeah. you can't hold it. Yeah. Yeah. Last week of stuff I can't ask in church, we're going to go through another series of questions. We're going to have some fun with it, but before we dive into this latest set of questions, I want to tell you a, a quick story, an experience that I had uh, at H-Mart. If you don't know what H-Mart is, that is the mecca for uh, Asians, and it is a supermarket for everything that I could possibly need to, to, to make the food that I, would, that I would eat for myself, my kids, if I have people over. And uh, if you've never been there, there's one in Linwood, that's the closest one, um, there, it will test your patience. On, on, on when you get to the parking lot. Because even though there are clear directions on which way you're supposed to go, there are, there are white arrows on the ground that tell you which direction to go, and the parking stalls are in the, the way of, of driving. You know what I'm talking about? Like, you, there's the flat ones, which can go either way, and if they're going this way, that means you're going that way. And it is super clear, but it does not matter, because it is like an apocalypse free-for-all with parking, there are cars driving from places that you didn't even know there was a driveway, and it can be massively frustrating. And I knew this, and usually when I know something is going to be rough, like when you know there's going to be traffic, like, oh, there's going to be traffic, you just sit in it. You're not as frustrated. Whereas you're driving, like this morning, I didn't know that they were shutting down the freeway this weekend. I just wasn't paying attention, and it's down to two lanes. I was like, oh. And those kinds of things, they frustrate you. And I, I knew this. And I'm walking in going, okay, cool. This is, this is we're, we're right in line. We're, we're, we're good to go. And I, uh, I, I go to look for a spot. And, and I drive right in. And sure enough, I, as I'm going in the correct direction, okay, there's another car coming this way. Now, they're not wide enough for two cars to easily fit. You have to really hug one side, and that person has to hug the other side, and it is massively frustrating. And as I'm, as I'm going, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to motion to her, go that, you're going the wrong way, and I'm, you know, you, you get, I'm screaming in my car, which makes no sense, because they can't hear you. I don't know why we do this. When someone cuts you off, why do we scream at them? They can't hear you. And I'm driving this way, and she's coming this way, and I'm like, you're going the wrong way. And she's pulling up closer to me, and I wind my window down, you're going the wrong way. And then something clicks in my head. I'm going to show you a quick picture. Let's go ahead and show that picture. Do you know what this is? This is, this is Korean writing. Do you know who can read Korean writing? Koreans. Yes, it's not a trick question. This caricature right here says Jesus. 
So as I'm driving, yelling at this lady who is Korean, she, she, she makes eye contact with me, and then she looks at my car, and you could just see the disappointment in her eyes. Like, I just felt it. Like you could feel like, ooh, you just represented Jesus so good. And I remember in that moment, as soon as I saw her look at my car, I knew exactly where she was looking. And I was like, oh, I wrote Jesus on my car. Dang it. And I just remember thinking in my head, I, I put the window back up and I did one of these. And not just, not my whole hand, not just one finger. And I, I did one of these. And, and I remember just thinking, Lord, forgive me. I just, I have failed you in this moment. I failed you. And I thought about that. And I thought about all the other times that I have failed other people. Now, that's, that's probably a really light extreme, but I don't know what she was going through. She might have been having a real bad day, and I made it worse. I don't know. Or she might have been having a great day, and I ruined it. I don't know. But we all have moments in our life where stuff happens to us, where we do stuff to people that, that, just, that just break that relationship. And today we're going to address some of the questions, the last few questions that came up, and these are some of the questions that, that people asked, and we've clumped them together. And it says, how do I forgive someone who has abused me? That's a tough one. Why is there so much hypocrisy in the church? That's another tough one. And how do I forgive people? These are, these are real issues that we all have. We all have issues with hypocrisy, and I, would, I wouldn't say that that's limited to the church. I just think it's more magnified because we claim to be Christ followers and we're supposed to be more loving. And so when we say hateful things, it's that much worse. But I believe that all of these things apply not only within the church, but outside in our own communities, wherever we live. So today we're going to dive right in. But before we get there, let's talk about what gets in the way. What gets in the way of us having this experience? What gets in the way of, of these things? And one of them is the ego. And that ego says that I'm okay. I did nothing wrong. I'm above this. The other is entitlement. Well, I deserve to be treated a certain way. And there was one more E that I forgot and for some reason got lost in the notes. But there's one more E. If it pops up in my head, it'll probably randomly happen. It'll be at a point that makes no sense. And I'll be like, oh, I remember the third E. But we'll come back to that one. Let's jump into Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. Oh, you know what? Now I know why. Go back one slide. I was on the wrong one. Expectations. I thought it would be different. And those are the things that get in the way of forgiveness. Those are the things that get in the way of us really pushing forward in the relationships. Ego, myself, entitlement, I don't deserve this, and expectations. I thought this would be different. So let's get into some scripture. Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 through 39 says this. You have heard the law that says that punishment must match the injury. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek also. Jesus is continually flipping tables, metaphorically and physically. And right here, he's, a, he's flipping a, a, a conventional practice that was widely accepted in that time. That in the Jewish culture, especially, specific right here, if you are wronged, then you get to wrong them back. If they take something from you, you get to receive something from them. If they accidentally kill one of your animals, you have to replace that animal. If you sleep with your, someone else's wife, you both die. This is, there's very little room for spiritual movement. There's very little room for forgiveness and mercy and grace and all of these other things because it was very clear from the beginning, hey, you do this, this happens. You wrong this person, they get to return the favor. And it was very clear from the beginning. And Jesus is saying, well, what if there is a different way? What if there's another way? And he's going to begin to unpack that through random stories, and he, like, like how he usually does. But as we unpack resentment, I wanted to look at some of the why. I wanted to look at the why of why there's confusion around the idea of forgiveness, why there's confusion around the idea of what resentment does to us in our heart. So the first question we're going to address is, why should I forgive? Before we answer that question, let's look at a story from Jesus. It says in Matthew chapter 18, verse 23, and you may have heard this story, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring uh, his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors, debtor, debt, debtor, one of the people that owed him money was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. 
He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me. I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him, and he released him and forgave his debt. Why should I forgive someone? Jesus lays this right here because resentment is built on unforgiveness. Unforgiveness puts a lock and a layer of concrete around your heart that continually builds and builds, and you create a resentment in your heart. And I would put good money on this, but you have probably, every person in this room has probably, and those watching online, have experienced forgiveness in some way. That you said or did something and you were forgiven. Everyone in here has experienced that. Do you remember what that felt like? Do you remember what it felt like when maybe you didn't deserve to be forgiven, but you were? Or maybe you were apologetic and humble and you fell before them, but they, they didn't have to react that way. You guys know that. You've apologized before and they're like, forget you, and they slap your hand away. But you know what that feels like. I was able to uh, get to know a company called Land of a Thousand Hills Coffee. If, you're, if, you've, if you've ever been to the South, they're, they're all over in the South. But uh, a guy named Gold, John Golden started it, and I got a chance to meet him when they were, they were fairly small. And you might see every once in a while wear a T-shirt that says, do good, drink coffee, or whatever it is. Uh, on my coffee cup, there's actually a sticker that says, forgiveness wins, and that's part of their tagline. But the reason um, that I got into them was I was randomly driving around, and I found their coffee shop. So I just stopped in and sat down and drank some coffee. And I was like, wow, this is really good coffee. And they said, yeah, we grew this in Uganda cool. I thought all coffee came from Colombia. And they're like, oh, James, I didn't know. I'm, I'm ignorant. <laughs> and, and he starts sharing all of this. And I did not know that, that John, who was telling me all this stuff, he was the owner of this company. And he's like, yeah, we roast it. Uh, we, we, we bag them. They come in green. And I didn't know coffee was green. Did you guys know that? They're green until you roast them. Who knew? Mind blown. And I, I was thinking, Starbucks, everything tastes like Starbucks. He's like, no, 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 no. And he's showing me some of these things and all these different roasts. And then, and then he starts sharing why they started the company. They started the company because if you didn't know this, in 1994, not that long ago, there was a mass genocide attempt between two people groups in Uganda. And they were almost successful. If it wasn't for the fact that there were, there were a lot of uh, people that would hide these people, the, the group that was, being, that was being persecuted and there was missionaries and all this stuff busting them out, they probably would have succeeded. But hundreds of thousands of people were killed only because of their nationality. That was it. 1994. That's not that long ago. And after that happened, what ended up uh, the, the, the main person, uh, Idi Amin, who was, who was, who was kind of driving all of this, he was, uh, he, was, he was taken down from authority, and I think he was assassinated, and, and all of a sudden, now this, this republic was broken. There was no source of income. It was, there was, these people still didn't like each other, obviously. One didn't trust the other, and the other one didn't trust them, but one didn't trust them because they were murderers, so I get that. And it created this economic downfall. So what he did was he said, well, what if we came in and we helped them create a sustainable way to build income? He's like, I don't know if it's going to work. I don't know if people's gonna, people are going to buy my coffee. But if we are able to grow 20,000 pounds of coffee, I'm just going to have coffee for life. It's not a bad deal. And he started this company and he found out that what would happen was these people would start to work together in lines and what happens when you're standing next to someone for a long period of time? You start to have conversations. You start to talk, chit-chat. At worst, oh, the weather's really hot. Yeah, it's Africa. Keep picking. You know, I mean, like, there's just all of these things. You just start to, to build rapport. And what I love is out of this, and he didn't know this was going to happen, but a few years after he started this free trade coffee movement, he would start to hear these stories. He would hear the stories of people who would work next to someone else who persecuted them. And one of my favorite stories was a woman whose husband was killed by soldiers when they came to her village and started wiping people out. And she was able to escape with the children, but her husband was 
was killed in the process. And she got placed in line next to the man who killed her husband. And she would share a story, and she struggled with it at first. And she's like, I don't know what to do with this. And then eventually that chit-chat kind of started happening, and uh, she became a believer through one of the missionary groups that was there. And she decided in her heart that she's going to forgive this man. And she forgave him, which then changed his heart. And I'm hearing his story, and he says, I fell at her feet, and I just wept, saying, I'm so sorry. And I just love that forgiveness can change lives. And you just see here story after story of women forgiving women and men forgiving men and, and all that because of all the stuff that was probably one of the hardest things to unpack, which was a murder attempt, right? And this is not an easy place. There's so many layers of story. There's so many experiences, actions. And I can't just stand up here and just pull an Elsa and just say, let it go. I just can't do that. I'm never going to just say, you just need to get over it, let it go. Because that's not how it works. Especially with so many layers of, of, of hurt that you might not even realize that you have. But what we can do is we can consciously and intentionally take small steps forward towards forgiveness. But what does that look like? Well, let's keep going. Second question, where's the line between healthy boundaries and a second chance? We have to address that. And he says it through a story. So he said that story. We're going to back up a few verses. He says, Then Peter came to him, this is Jesus, and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Where is that boundary? Where is that second chance? In Scripture here, he uses the analogy of the forgiving master and the, and the, 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 the guy that owed him millions. He says that in response to this moment right here when Peter says, Okay, let's talk about forgiveness. Now, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a number out there, Jesus. Seven. It's a good number. Back then, it would have been considered the perfect number. Perfect number. Symbol of perfection. God created seven, uh, the earth and seven, you know, that whole thing. And in the Jewish custom, the acceptable, accept, man, I can't talk today, acceptable number of times that you can forgive someone was three. That was... The, the, the accepted number, That's, that was it. If you forgave someone three times, you did a great job. So Peter coming in saying, well, I'm super holy because I'm a Jesus follower. Jesus, seven. Let's double it and add one. Pat me on the back. Jesus says, no. How about 70 times seven? 490 times? But three was the acceptable number. What? 490? What about 491? If they do 491, then can I call it quits? I can imagine Peter arguing that because I would have. <laughs> but how? 490 times is a lot. I mean, it's a ton. It's Jesus using those perfect numbers and suggesting that there shouldn't be a cap. That forgiveness should not have an expiration date. And he's expressing that to him. And I don't believe, though... That when Jesus says these words, that he is saying that we should, be, we should allow ourselves to be run over every single time. I don't believe he says that either. Instead, again, as I said in the beginning, I think he's creating a moment. He's creating an opportunity for a healthy move of the Holy Spirit. And if we know that there's a limit, if there's three or seven and that person is at two or six, then we know that that, that space for that movement of the Holy Spirit is going to be limited and decrease, and we're, we may not even allow spiritual movement to happen because we know, well, you're up against it. You're down 0-2 in the count, buddy. One more and you're out. And we don't give that grace, but if it's 490 and they're at 2, all of a sudden you've created a bigger margin to say, wait, hold on a second. Let's put that rock down. Let's figure out another solution. I think we can do this. And that moment would immediately switch from vengeance mode to let's work this out. I have a friend who, um, she, uh, she grew up in an uh, alcoholic home. Both her parents were alcoholics, her grandparents were alcoholics, just kind of passed it down 
from generation to generation, and she did not. She wanted nothing to do with it, so she went the other way and said, I will not drink the drops because my family history says that this is probably not healthy. And uh, what ended up happening was uh, she developed a more close relationship with her grandparents, and you know, uh, you know how it is, grandparents, you guys have this unique connection to your grandkids, and, and she started expressing some of the hurt that was happening because her parents weren't physically or really emotionally abusive, but they would just verbally say things that just, they just weren't nice. And she would, she would come home and she would, you know, get five A's and a B and they would say, oh, you almost did good. You know, and they would just kind of like those little comments where it wasn't great, but you wouldn't necessarily think, oh, that's, that's an abusive relationship. And then she started having kids and She'd bring her kids over, and, and they would say things like, oh, your kid's pretty cute, but you know what? My friend has a granddaughter. She is so much cuter. You know, just little things like that where you're like, really? You just said that? And it was, it was bothering her. It was hurting her, and she'd been going through this for her entire life, so decade upon decade of, of this, this weight that she felt, and it just created this bitterness and resentment inside of her towards her parents to the point where she just says, I am, I'm not going to come over. I'm not bringing my kids over. You guys are cut off. Now, you can imagine that that probably went well. Well, why? What did we do? Well, you're drunk all the time. Nuh-uh. And it just created this issue. But then she started working through it. She realized in her heart that even though this was a hurtful process, even though the boundary had been broken, she still wanted her kids to know their grandparents. So she actively sought out counseling. She got into a mentorship program. She really just worked through it. And little by little, she created little tiny baby step boundaries with her parents where she would say, okay, I'm coming over this week, but if you say or do anything, I'm not coming over at all next month. And she would create these boundaries. And at first, they broke every boundary. But then after a while, after a few months, all of a sudden, they started respecting these, these things, these gates that she would put up and say, well, I want them to be in your life. I want to be in your life, but some things have to change. But those baby steps did not start. And I asked her about this. They didn't start until she forgave her parents. She forgave them for, for what they did, of what their addictions were, all those things. And she just created a spiritual movement, movement in her own heart. She knew that she can't change them, but she can change herself. And she created that movement and that opportunity, and God worked. And it allowed her to have grace and mercy and strength as she took those baby steps towards resolving that relationship. Healthy boundaries are good, absolutely. Absolutely. And I believe Jesus would absolutely say the same thing, like there needs to be healthy boundaries. But if you don't create that space for forgiveness and you don't create that moment for God to come in and say, let me massage, let me work, let me do some miracle, miracle things in your life, then what are we doing? Well, what about extreme cases? Question number three. Let's keep, keep going in verse 29. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me. I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. Extreme cases. So this guy who has just been forgiven millions of dollars had a, another servant owe him about $1,000, and he throws him in jail. He has every right to do that. According to Jewish law, if someone owes you, you can put them in jail until they pay it off, which I thought was kind of weird because how do you... How do you pay it off when you're in jail, right? Is there, is there, is there like a chain gang kind of situation? I have no idea. But it's, it's, posed, it's set up that way probably so that you're, you win. Accountability is not the same as forgiveness. I want you to hear that. Our ask from God and Jesus is that we forgive. The accountability part that's, that's God. God will take care of that. And I just, I, I love how Jesus put it in story form. I love how he, he would take something that seems so hard to understand, like forgiveness, and he would say, well, let me show you a couple of different examples. Here's what happens when you don't forgive. 
And we know later in the story that the master finds out and throws him in jail too. And he forgives the other, other guy. But I look at these examples and I think about all the hurt that we have probably experienced in this room and those watching online. And I think, man, how in the world are we going to heal from that? And the answer is, it's got to be miraculous. It's got to be an explosion in your heart of God doing something. And I know it's not easy, and maybe it's some counseling as well, too, but there's, all, there's a lot of resources that you do have at your hands and your disposal to get to the point where you're able to take those steps towards forgiveness. I want to show you guys a video. This is uh, from one of the ladies at our Woodenville campus, and I just love her story. Of, of where she came from, and um, she, she graduated, I should say graduated, but she is currently in our, um, one of our uh, substance abuse programs, and she is, uh, she's an awesome lady, and I just want you to watch her video, and then, and then we'll, keep, we'll keep talking. I've always believed in God, or I should maybe more say that there was always God, but then there was a darkness in me, and that darkness called and as I grew grew up um, and um, I started turning towards the darkness and turning away from again. God and part of that darkness was my addiction to alcohol I used alcohol I know it's dark and she's saying darkness so it's that's not I've always not believed intended. in God or I should maybe more say it's a really good story I've always believed go. in God, or I should maybe more say that there was always God, but then there was a darkness in me, and that darkness called. And as I grew, grew up, um, and um, I started turning towards the darkness and turning away from God. And part of that darkness was my addiction to alcohol. I used alcohol instead of turning towards God. Like I used that as my pain relief as opposed to God. I think it comes, it comes to a head when, um, when my son is diagnosed with autism and as it was constant doctor's appointments and I just kept feeling more and more alone and I, and I kept turning towards the, the alcohol, the darkness. I was spinning around in my dark circle and he sent in an angel in the form of a counselor and she was the one that I was completely honest about, about my alcohol use. And, um, and I'd like to say that she lovingly guided me um, into the rooms of AA, but I think at one point it was like she shoved me, <laughs> like, you stubborn old goat. <laughs> These people can help you, right? Of one of the rooms there, I walked in and I felt something for the first time that I hadn't felt before. I felt that light, that light that was trying to shine through, that God was saying, look, and, um, and I felt hope, and I hadn't felt that in a really long time. And I felt that just sitting down and God was all around me, right? But that's where the real work began, right? If I, if I try not to, I don't know, sharing this is a lot, but I, I thought I caused my son's autism. I truly believe that because of my alcohol use. And so I held on to that and I punished myself for that over and over again. And my, my sponsor said, it's time to let that go. It's time to let that go. She had me write out my whole experience with autism, um, all of the struggles, all of it. And we were sitting in the park one day and I was reading her this. And then it all hit me that, I, that this was a cross that I had been carrying and it wasn't mine to carry any longer. Right? That nothing in God's world happens by mistake. There's a purpose for everything. And, and instead of looking at it as like this, this thing that I caused, which is so preposterous now to think about, right? Um, but at the time, I, for so long, I wanted to carry that, but it was no longer mine to carry. And so um, gratefully, I was able to release that. Yeah, that you might feel alone in the darkness, but turn turn your back to the darkness and towards the light and God. Um, that's where my salvation is. There's an example of 
someone who had to forgive herself. And like I said, there's, there's people that we have to forgive. There's there are ourselves we have to forgive. There's things that we have possibly done that we just feel guilty about. And the reality is that every person on this earth has the potential to harm you, and you have the potential to harm other people. It's called sin nature. It's in our DNA. Pastors, politicians, moms, dads, neighbors, friends, teachers, cops, baristas, we all have an opportunity to hurt. Your occupation, your social status does not protect you from the possibility of someone wronging you or you wronging them. We live in a world of unforgiveness. And we've even labeled some of that as cancel culture, right? But Christ followers, we're the opposite of cancel culture. We live in a grace culture and a mercy culture. And I know it's not, again, there's extreme cases. I know that there's, there's, there's deep hurt in some circumstances, and there's abuse, and, and all of these things, and you may, may have never heard the word, I'm sorry, from this other person, and I, and I understand that. And I'm not saying that those are not important, and I'm not saying that you should just let that go and, and just get over it, because there's, there's no way. But what I can tell you is that forgiveness is important to your heart. It is. In fact, I think it's a bigger deal for you than it is for the other person. If you're forgiving the other person, I think it's bigger for you. Because you were deciding to allow God to move in your heart and change you. You were making that conscious decision. The thing that only you can control, you are doing it. The thing that only you can provide and give to God and lay at his feet, you are doing. And it's massively important. But how do we even do this? That's the last question. How do we even do this? It's not easy. One more piece of scripture before we kind of close this out. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? This is the master speaking to that guy that would not forgive his fellow servant who owed him a, a little amount of money, even though he was acquitted of all of this debt. And the point here that Jesus is trying to make, that the disciples won't even understand until a long time after this, is that Jesus went to the cross. He went, he physically put himself in the position of the cross and dying, and he still forgave us. He didn't deserve it. He committed no crime. But he went and died so that we can experience forgiveness. And everything that Jesus said and did while on this earth is a blueprint for our living right there. From community to forgiveness, he laid it all out for us. One of the things that I want to do today is the band's going to come back up here. And I want us to really think about the idea of forgiveness and what that means. It's not easy, I know. I know it's not. If you're anything like your pastor, then this is probably one of the hardest things because vengeance is my spiritual gift. I have a unique way of getting back at you. It's, it's a gift. It's, it has to be a spiritual gift, right? There's no other way to put it. Um, I mean, it could be sin, but I don't want to go there. But if you're anything like me, this is difficult because when someone wrongs you, when someone says something that you're just like can't believe you said and did that the last thing you want to do is forgive them that's the last thing but what if just that simple movement forward of saying i don't understand why you did this i don't even have to be okay with it but i'm going to forgive you because i want to move forward because i want to create a space of healing in my own heart and i can't heal carrying that weight what if it's just that simple that you're just wanting to take that next step. And what I love about this last verse is that, the, that Jesus is reminding that if you want forgiveness from God because we mess up, then we need to show it to others. And again, this is not easy. There's history. There's all this other stuff. And I'm not trying to make any, anything light of that. But we need to create moments and movement and space for spiritual healing. So if there is something in your heart that you, there, you've just been carrying resentment, bitterness, and you just need to forgive, I'm going to give you a little bit of space right now to work through that. 
And I don't know what that looks like for each and every one of you, but I want, to, I want that process here. And Dave's going to sing, and we're going to, we're going to do a song together, and it just it talks about God's mercy and his grace. And I just use this moment to spend some time wrestling with that. What is it that you're missing out on because you're holding on to this resentment that you don't need to? Let me pray for you, and then we're going to, we're going to take on the cross mentality. Heavenly Father, I just ask right now, Lord, forgiveness is hard, I know. I know it's hard. And there are people in here wrestling with that very thought, and there is a forgiveness level that's on the spectrum from just a small slight to a, a giant, personal, deep wound, and everything in between. And I just pray right now, God, that that we begin to work through it, that we begin to take that first step forward where we create space for spiritual healing, where we let go just a little bit of that resentment so that we can hold on to you. So God, I pray that we wrestle with this, that forgiveness really is about healing our heart. God, we're so thankful that you're so willing to forgive us. So I just pray that in this moment, we truly wrestle with this, that we truly take that first move of saying, I forgive. And I ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen.
want to end with one final thought that Jesus knew what he was going to have to do by carrying the cross and he did it anyways because he loved us so as we leave today wherever you're at on this forgiveness journey I want you to be reminded that forgiveness is absolutely your choice you get to choose that no matter what your situation is you may not be able to control everything that's happening but you can control what your heart does my encouragement to you is start taking those steps forward. Have a blessed week, and I'll see you guys next week.